Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 690, with Chris Schultz. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest back on the show for a second time, Chris Schultz. My man, Chris, are you feeling unstoppable today? Eric, I'm feeling unstoppable. I can't believe we're sitting across the I table know. from each other. Right on. Right? right on. Appreciate you coming out. Oh, man. It's, it's an honor to be here when I found out you're in Houston. I'm living in Austin now. So when oh, I found yeah. out you're in Houston, I was like, Chris, I'll make the three-hour drive. I know. Like, let's make this happen. Because uh, just for, for a little background, so Chris and I met almost five, four years ago at the NRA show. I was a moderator the foodable platform you were one of the the guests on the uh i don't know the, the stage that day that the the talk we we're moderating we were talking about culture and you were just such a great uh panelist that i was like i gotta get chris on the show so a few months after that chris was on the show he was episode 341 one of my best episodes to date i'm gonna be sure to link to that episode in the show notes i might even play it a week before for all my listeners who haven't listened to it so they can get caught up so if you want you can hit pause right now go back to episode 341 and yeah. hear me, hear me four years ago. <laughs> yeah, you can hear the evolution of the show, right? <laughs> and uh, back then, you were working for Mod Pizza, right? Uh, before Mod, you were with Starbucks. You I was, there. yeah, I was you, there you, you 12 took, years, 12, yeah, 13 years. Yeah, you took Starbucks from, I want to say it was 200 locations to 20,000 locations. Right, and Then yeah. you joined Mod Pizza with one location. One location. Helped them scale to how many locations? I left, uh, I think, 330 is when I left. 330 here, 325. So, you know, wow, when, you, when you open a bunch of restaurants. That's incredible. The numbers sort of blend. And then uh, I think it was two years ago you left Mod Pizza. I did. Um, and you joined Voodoo Donut. And that's where we are today. And yeah. um, you just, ex- you guys are in here in Houston. We're sitting in Houston. And we're going to basically just pick up the conversation where we left off. And I cannot wait. Because you were, like I said, one of my best guests. Oh, no pressure, Chris. That's very kind. Of. You said, I'm sure you said it to all your guests, but uh, I'll take it sincerely. Th- this one, I mean it this time. You were incredible. So why don't we get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling like we always do. Take it from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so I think last time we talked about other things, but for me in my space we're at today, uh, my mantra is failure is not an option. Failure is right? not it, an option. It's interesting what you do when you row the boat ashore and you burn the boat. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's amazing things you can accomplish when that's your mantra, that's your mindset, that failure is just not an option. How, how do you show up differently every day when you have that mentality? What's going on? You know, I think you, I think you show up and, and when problems arise, I mean, we're in the restaurant business, right? Problems are going to happen every single day, every single hour, something's going to happen. And, and when, when you have the mantra, have the mindset of failure is just not an option, we've got to find a way to make it happen. And you build that into your employees, into your leadership group. Um, they look at things very differently, right? They come to you with solves and not just problems, right? Exactly. Being a leader, they continue to bring you problems every day. Every day, right? Yeah. Here, I've got an issue with this. And what we've built in my organization today, or in our organization today, is don't bring a problem, bring a solve, right? And so that that's the fair on option mindset. Of I've got to figure out a solution, and then I'm bringing it to Chris. We're going to talk about it as a team because we've got to have a solve. We've got to have something to figure that out, right? Yes. And, uh you know, when you're a growing business like we are today here at Voodoo, we'll talk a little bit more, I'm sure, about that. Um, there's just a variety of things that happen every single day. Yeah. And just listening to you talk, I can't help but think what's actually going on with them in the mind. When you say something can't be done or when you identify or label something as not possible, your mind shuts off. That creative part of your mind, just your, your, your mind is doing this to save energy. It doesn't, your mind takes a lot of energy. When you tell yourself it can't be done, your mind goes, okay, like, let's move this to the back burner. Like, let, this is off our plate. But when you say, you know, failure is not a, po- a possibility. When you when you weave that into your culture, the the frontal lobe kicks into hyper gear, and you find ways you get creative to solve problems and make it happen. It's so powerful. And I think you learn to grow, right? Your team members grow because they're constantly looking for ways for solve, right? They can't come and throw up their hands and go, "I don't have an answer for this, Chris. I need to get it figured out." And 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 so for us, that mindset built in helps helps the leaders grow, whether you're at the store level or at the at the at the upper management level. Um, you grow, right? You grow as an individual because you start to think about, well, I've faced this problem before. What do I need to do to, to get a solve? I can't, I can't come to him and say, gosh, we just can't do that. Um, it's just, it's not a possibility, right? Awesome. And, yeah. uh, yep. So it's a very different mindset. Great way to get this show started, Chris. Um, so when I found out that you left uh, Mod Pizza, yeah. I was really surprised because when you're on the show, you had such amazing things to say about this organization. Uh. Uh, especially the people. You said yeah. it was the people that brought you on in the first place. Uh, it was a gut feeling that they were just the right people, and that's what attracted you to this organization. So take it from where you left off. Like, what, what happened between yeah, so, uh, the last... Yeah, so it was a great run at eight and a half years of Mod Pizza. We'd opened 10 in the UK. It just was the right time for me. It was the right time 
uh, for other leaderships to, to join in and take it to that next level. Mod was going to continue to grow, and, and quite candidly and openly, I'm not sure that I was the guy to take it to a thousand stores. Right? Why, in that why role. do you say that? You know, I'm 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 good at where where I think growing happens and, and growth and kind of that continuum motion. Um, at a certain point in time, and, and everyone I'm sure listening to podcasts understands this, there are people that are really good from one to five, from five to ten, from ten to a hundred. There's different skill sets that are necessary yeah. when you start to scale. Yeah. You're looking at things very differently. Um, you're looking at, at every little penny or dime on the floor, right? I'm picking up quarters and dollars right now on the yeah. floor. We talk a little bit about that. Yeah. It's kind of why I look at restaurants. <laughs> um, I'm looking for $10 bills and, and $100 bills, not for the dimes and pennies yet. Yeah. Um, and so it was, just, it was just time. It was time for Maude. It was time for me uh, to just make a change. Listen, it's a great group over there. I'm still an investor in the company. I'm so actively involved in I talk to Scott on a regular basis, Scott Svensson, the CEO, on a regular basis. Um, but I think really for Mod to continue to grow where they need to grow to and what they needed, um, I probably didn't have the skill set. I know, and sometimes it's difficult to say, right? As a as a restaurant leader, been in the restaurant business for forty years, you think I can do anything? Yeah. And and the reality is that's not so much true all the time. Well, right? you know, listening to you talk, and what's coming into my mind is this this idea that um, they say self awareness is the peak of emotional intelligence, right? Oh, and yeah. it sounds like you're just very self aware of your situation, where your strengths are. And you've been in this industry now for what, like thirty years? Forty years. Forty years. I was just telling the story today, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell on myself. I just had a fifty sixth birthday, fifty six years birthday. old. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I and I know forty years because um, for my sixteenth birthday, my dad gave me a job. Okay. At a restaurant, and I don't know if we talked about this at a Mexican restaurant. I think we mentioned it briefly. In the yeah, first and I was a dishwasher for three years, where they called me Carlos, <laughs> right? Um, and so I've been in the restaurant business forty years. I, I think we talked about this. I didn't go to college and, and get a master's degree in business. I worked in restaurants my entire career. So for forty years, I've been in restaurants, all types of different restaurants, and and so you know that 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 uh, part about understanding yourself. I have great mentors who help me understand kind of my yes. limitations and, and have helped me kind of explore what, what I'm good at and what I'm gonna, what's going to get me out of bed every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so combined with my skill set and combined is, do I really want to get out of bed at 500 stores and go to a corporate office and talk about the pennies and the nickels? I just, that doesn't gig me, right? Yeah. That just doesn't invigorate me. And, um, and it, you know, so the reality was Voodoo just came across. I was still at Mod. Voodoo came across my desk uh, from a friend of mine. And when you talk about the story of Voodoo, um, they had an inflection of cash that had come in, some private equity funds had come in, and they were now looking to grow. And someone came to me, a friend, a mentor of mine, um, Greg Johnson, came to me and said, hey, Voodoo's looking for a CEO. Would you ever consider going down to Portland? And I said, well, I live in Seattle now. Um, you know, two things I'm not going to do. I'm not going to write a resume. I've been doing this for too long, <laughs> and I'm not moving to Portland. Yeah. Well, I now live in Portland. Um, I didn't write a resume, um, <laughs> but it's just a, a, an opportunity I couldn't pass up, yes. right? Um, you know, if I look at my last 25 years of my career, you know, 14 at Starbucks, eight at Mod. Boy, now it's Voodoo, right? What what kind of what kind of experience is that when you think about brands, cult brands that are out there? Yes. Just unique cult brands, right? All in their own different ways. Unique and cult in their own different followings. Starbucks obviously has their niche. Mod built their niche, and Voodoo has built their niche obviously over the years. So um, I just couldn't say no. I just, yes. there was no way that I could say no. I made notes of the things you just share with us, specifically why you couldn't pass this opportunity up, and the significance of identifying a cult following. Um, but real quick, um, just to kind of come full circle, the reason why I, I was pointing out that you were you've been in this industry for forty years. I think at this point, it's okay to say I'm a specialist. My sweet spot is going from like a couple locations to like 200. Like yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Like I've done it a few times now or you yeah. know you've helped companies scale. And I think it's important that you identify like a niche and that you own that niche. This is your first CEO position, isn't it? It is. It is you, my first CEO. Were you position. the director of operations for Mod or I was the senior lines? VP of operations for Mod. Okay. Um, yeah, it's my first CEO opportunity and uh, you know it's interesting though uh, if you do this right um, the buck stops with me when I was a senior VP. The buck stops me when I was a director of operations at, at Starbucks. It didn't doesn't really matter, right? The title's great, and listen, there's a lot of accoutrements that come with to be CEO. Um, people perk their ears up when you say that you're the CEO. Um, I heard a guy say the other day, we we're in line here in Houston, and I was out in front, and I happened to be in the Houston Chronicle on the business section the day before, and someone said, there's the CEO, and the other guy next to him said, well, he's just the CEO of a donut shop. <laughs> 
and and it kind of got. I was like, it was a gut check, right? Yeah. It was a gut check because here I was with my big feathers and my big, you know, crowing, you know, here yeah. the lines out the door. It's an hour and a half wait to get into voodoo, and I'm kind of posing out in front, <laughs> not realize I'm posing, but I'm posing. Yeah. Uh, and I heard that and I was like gut check, and I went back to my hotel that night and thought, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm just a guy that works in a restaurant. I'm a leader. Um, I've chosen to be a leader. And whether I'm the CEO, the czar of donut, it doesn't really matter. But uh, at the end of the day, if, if you don't own what you do and you don't feel like you're the CEO of the business, no matter what your title is, if you don't feel like you're the yes. CEO of the business, man, go do something else. That's a nugget right there. Right? If you it's don't feel like this. And the, the, the words that come into my mind when you say that are treat it like you own it. Right. And if you treat it like you own it someday, you eventually will in one form or another. Right. Um, and it, it, th- there's a book about this. Uh that, to create that culture of a company of uh, that people uh, that feel like they own it, it's called My Company too. Um, right. Great, ep- great book. Uh, had the author on the show. I'll link oh, to yeah. that as well. So anyway, um, what was that transition like from uh, an operations like a like vice president of operations yeah. to CEO? Like, what did your life look like in those two different? Yeah. Scenarios? Well, uh, you know, as, as we spoke about at Mod, obviously in the very early days, I was actively involved in everything and. Um, and as the business grew, obviously we brought on specialists and people that are really good at, at their areas of, of, op, of uh, business, supply chain, HR, areas that I was obviously overseeing at some point in time in that, in that development. Um, and, and I kind of change. It's funny. I tell people it's an interesting world because at Mod in the early days, you know, I'd be in the office and, I'd be, and we didn't really have an office. We had an office above a, an apartment building or above a garage. And we'd be out of copy paper. Like, who gets the copy paper on it? Because I'd come from Starbucks, right? Yeah. And there was always copy paper everywhere. <laughs> I was like, well, that'd be me, right? I need to get the copy paper. And then as we grew at Mod, now we had a big office and we had copy paper. And I remember walking to Voodoo the very first day and we're in his offices. And I was going to go make a copy and we're out of paper. And I said, well, who gets the copy paper? Like, there's no copy paper. Like, oh, yeah, Chris, well, just call down to Staples and, or make an order and go get it. And I was like... Oh, I'm right back into that again. <laughs> Here we go again, right? Here we go again. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, but that's the part of it, right? So that transition happened. Um, Voodoo had been in business for 15 years. Listen, I'm I'm not the savior of Voodoo Donut. Uh, the reality was, it's a, it, they built a really strong business. They had a cult following. They'd done really, really well. They'd opened six units, including one in Universal Studio City Walk in LA and in Orlando, and had done really well. Yeah. Um, but it was, it, and I think the the founders will tell you, it was a little stagnant, right? The brand really wasn't growing that much, and more importantly, we had almost 200 folks working for us that weren't developing, weren't growing. They weren't being given opportunities because without growing stores, those folks can't grow. Yes. Right? Okay. I, I love what, where you're going with this. Um, one more thing is yeah. on my mind about uh, Mod Pizza. Yeah. What, what was the, because I don't ever get to talk to, I don't always get to talk to people who get to, to take a concept from and scale it <laughs> in one location, right? And then go to another nation and try to scale. Yeah. What was that like going to a different territory? Like, uh, you were in the United Kingdom, right? I was. Yeah, I was. So I had had a little bit of experience with that. I was with Starbucks. Uh, and I went over and helped open the very first store in the UK on yeah. Kings Road. So I had a little bit of experience of working internationally with Starbucks, but very, very small. Um, but with Mod, it was a very different experience, right? We had to choose a partner, and, and Mod chose Sir Charles Dunstan, who had brought five guys over to the UK. Um, and then it's really, you know, starting that culture again, right, from birthing it again yeah. in the UK. And it, it looks a little different in the UK than it, than it does here in the US because it's a different culture, different people. Um, but it was exciting. They, they, had, they identified a great leader who came over from Nando's, John Nelson, who took over the mod CEO in, in the UK. But uh, it was a lot of long hours. So s- some of the things you got to consider when I'm hearing from you is when you're transitioning from uh, internationally, um, why bring, well, first, bring on a partner. It sounds like it's something you might want to consider. Yeah. And the second thing you said is considering the cultural differences in that area. Like, can we do mod the United States version in the United, in the yeah, United Kingdom. Yeah, right. Yeah, people, so, people are used to queuing, but they're not used to queuing and then finding a table, right? Fast casual doesn't exist in the UK. Okay. So our vision of fast casual, the subway, the Chipotle's of the world, um, doesn't exist in the UK. They're so, there, but they're not yeah. as relevant. So I just want to say that again just to make sure the listeners heard. Uh, so they're used to queuing, meaning they're used to standing in line. Right. But they're not used to having to find their own table. So you have to kind of, there's a give and take a little bit to cultural differences. Absolutely. And, and they want to take their time, right? And they're kind of learning. So um, they're learning the menu, right? They're also not, uh, at least my experience there was, uh, the UK crowd in general 
isn't super used to, to challenging, you know, if you have a menu item, they're not going to, like in the U.S. where I want no mayonnaise and no tomato and I want it grilled and I want it, uh, you know, it, here modifiers just exist yeah. everywhere they go. It's just yeah. a norm, People right? want to customize. It's just We're a norm. We're entitled freaking Americans. Exactly. In the U.K., <laughs> they're like, well, if that's what the chef chose, and I yeah. guess that's trust the right the product, trust the chef. Yeah. Um, and so I spent, uh, you know, we, we opened, uh, when I left, we'd open eight in the U.K. I, I probably... I got to a point in time in the UK, I'd gone back so many times that uh, my passport I could go through as a UK citizen. That's how often I'd gone back. That's awesome. Um, but you learned a lot, right? It's, it's sourcing product. Product isn't the same. So how do you find the same cheese? How do you find the same pepperoni, the same sausage? And Maud spent, we spent months and months and months trying to identify the same product so it looked and felt the same, right? Um, it's a challenge, but it's going to be say, done. That, that in itself is just a challenge, trying to keep it consistent with an ocean in between. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. But, you know, the world's so small and enough. When we started hiring folks, um, the culture of people isn't, isn't that different, right? Yeah. The world's so small now. We're, we're all 99.9% .9 exactly the same. Exactly the same, day. right? <laughs> yeah. and so, we lose sight uh, of that. We, when we look at people as being so different, but we're all so much alike, especially with how we feel. We, like. And uh, we, we all have the same hard wiring, right? And work environments, right? Yeah. People want to be treated fairly, right? They want to treat as individuals. They want, to, they want to feel like they're working for something bigger than just a paycheck. So that was something that you spoke a lot about in our first, inter yeah. our first interview, the significance of recognizing that millennials and, and Generation Z want to be seen as individuals. Is that the same thing happening in the UK? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's no different. It's the same 18 to 28-year-old that, yeah. that we tend to hire, I guess, in, in, in this business, right? Right, um, transitional, if you will, at best. Um, trying to find those those key yeah. nuggets, those key folks that really want to stay with you. And again, what I've come to, to realize, whether you're in the UK or Houston, um, people want to work for a company that stands for something, and they want to see the CEO, they want to see the leader. Right? There, there's no longer you can't sit in the in the glass tower. All due respect to the, those that do it, and just kind of dictate down. Right? Yeah. Um, they want to see and they want to know and they want to know you're somebody. I mean, I think Simon Sinek probably speaks to this the best and eaters, yeah. well, leaders eat last. Right. And it's what happens when you, there's so many uh, degrees of separation. My favorite book right now. It's such a great book. And when there's so many degrees of separation, usually it's like we can only handle about 150 relationships. So when you start to have, put more relationships into your life beyond 150, you lose touch with those people at the very end, right? right. So like that, that culture is being displaced. So. Absolutely. I mean, that's, is that kind of what you're Yeah, doing? absolutely. Listen, and, and we know, you know, part of the challenge in the restaurant industry today is this, this um, heightening of minimum wages, right? We're all challenged now. How do we balance that out? And, you know, part of my, my, my DNA is that, listen, we just hold people accountable, right? Treat people like people. Treat them like adults. Um, you know, we, we, at Voodoo, we do the same thing we do at Mod. We don't have a lot of rules. We don't have a big rule book that we follow. Um, but treat them fairly, right? Yeah. Treat them like individuals. Treat them like adults. And, and that's part of what I think the ethos has been of the success of Voodoo, sorry, the success of Mod originally. And kind of what I brought over now is just who I am. I yeah. learned it way back when we talked about this, I think, on the last podcast. Um, you know, Howard Bihar is a big mentor of mine and continues to be my ser servant leadership. And um, and is I he, think is, is he the man that coined that term? He, sure. Well, I I don't know what he he is he is you know he was one of the founders of Starbucks. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned his book. Uh, it's not about the coffee. The last yes. time we were on the podcast. You know, you mentioned that book, and and I said I was going to read it immediately after you got off, and I did not. And yeah. I I'm, I'm like I'm kicking myself. You got to right go now. back. You got to go. I back. do. I do. Go back. But um, you know, he was one of the ones, and really, a, a, I attribute a lot of who I am as an individual as a leader. To lessons I learned from him 20 years ago, Man. right? And they're still relevant today. I would love to get him on the show. Um, it's just, it's amazing, right? It's, he's an amazing individual who really speaks about treating people like individuals, yeah. letting people be themselves, and, and being respectful of the work they do, right? We all we all go to work for a paycheck, right? And and that's why we go to work. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be a job, right? Yeah, I mean, we go yeah. to, to, to work for a paycheck to ensure that we have security. That's the, the second need, you know, above you know your your human needs like food and shelter the next thing is security and t today's paycheck can cover that for the most part but what's next right 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 and like that's what we need to focus on is like the, the, the i think next. so i think so and i you know i think uh it's going to be more and more competitive as minimum wages start to flatten out across the country at, at yeah. a certain level and you can't be you can't differentiate yourself by pay, yeah right yeah you just can't any longer because we can't afford it drop this name this gentleman's name on me one more time howard behar 
Howard Bihar, and where is he located right now? He's out in Seattle. Okay, um, I'm making sure he gets on my he's list. He's a huge, huge mentor <laughs> of mine, and those that follow your podcast, I mean, his name will be known. Yes, um, he's he's a great man and a great great mentor. So of mine. I'm chomping at the bit to yeah. start talking about uh, Voodoo Donut. Yeah, please. Did, uh, did you answer the question um, with why it's important to think about partners when going overseas? Did you touch on that? No, but but we can we can talk about it for just Real a second. Quick, yeah. And 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 with Mod, we had several different opportunities. We met with several different folks, uh, t- potential partnerships, and um, and I don't want to go into the laundry list. Yeah. But, but we spent almost a month um, vetting partners and really identifying partners, and and really we landed on folks that really believed in the culture more than the business. Right. I think it's more important when you select a partner in the UK or anywhere you go internationally or anywhere you go even domestically. Um, if you're franchising, I haven't been, you know, mod franchise a little bit, but even in mod, it's super important that you identify a person that's that understands the culture and what kind of culture you're trying to build in the company, even more than the business, right? Because the culture is so such it morphs, right? And it's hard to define. It's not in the book to read. And if you can identify those partners that truly understand the culture and what yeah. you want to build as an organization. The business model will work because you have a book to hand them. Exactly. Well, the culture is the reality of who you are. So right. you have to make sure that the reality of who this person is that you're partnering with is that they are an believe extension of who you are. Yeah, they yeah. believe in it, right? Like, we all, yeah, exactly. you got to live it. you got to yeah. live it. It's, it's reality. So yeah. awesome stuff. Um, okay, I think we can uh, right there take a quick break to uh, thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to get into the story of Voodoo Donut. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. So we're back, and um, you mentioned uh, when you came on board, Voodoo Donut was 10 years in, six locations, 200 employees. Yeah. Did I hear that right? 15 years. 15 years They've been 15 years in existence. Six, I think six. I'm going to count off the top of my head again. Six. So Uh, what's unique about your story is that you're successful as an individual at this point. Like, you you know, like... (laughs) You have it depends on how you in, define ex- well. You know you're yeah. doing all right. right. Like yeah, you yeah. have you're in a position to be kind of picky right. with where you go, how you spend your time, and who you invest in. What was it about before when you said you wanted to spend time with Mod? Right. It was about the, the people, the relationships. Right. What is it about the the Voodoo Donut team? What would paint that picture of why they were so appealing? To yeah. You? So um, you know, part of it was I'd always known about Voodoo, obviously, and I think everybody kind of knows about. It. They've heard about Voodoo somewhere. They've heard about the NyQuil donut or the or the you know whatever we've done Pepto Bismol donut. They've seen us on many TV shows, Food Network. Anthony Bourdain was a big was a big fan of ours, um, and so you know it was a cult following, right? And if you went to Portland, if you look at any list anywhere, Frommans, anywhere you TripAdvisor, top ten things to do in Portland, Voodoo's on every list. You got to go to you go to Powell Books and you go to Voodoo Donut, and then it's go see the waterfall. Um, and so when, when I was approached to potentially come to Voodoo, I met with the, 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 uh, the private equity group that was investing in Voodoo and, and really got their sense of growing it the right way, right? They didn't want to grow on every street corner. I didn't believe that Voodoo was a brand that could be on every street corner. Um, it had to be exclusive. It had to stay exclusive, right? And they believed in that. And they were like, let's just grow the brand in a, in a pace that we feel comfortable with. And then I met with the two founders, uh, Trace and Cat Daddy. And uh, these guys are just two wacky guys. Um, that were bartenders back in the day and had an idea to open a donut shop, right? And, and, and they had built this really phenomenal brand, this cult following brand, really just off the back of them being marketers and really with a little, very little focus on the operations or the execution or customer service or their team, right? They took very good care of their folks, but, you know, they had kind of, they've kind of done their, with their limit. We talked about know your limits, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think they were at that point in time. Yeah. And so when I met with them originally, I, you know, my, my original thought was, holy cow, this could be a lot of work again, right? And, and it's been double the work that, it, that I thought it was going to be, triple the work that I thought it was going to be. Um, but the reality was I came down and met with the team in the office, and these people just, they bled voodoo pink, right? They were like all in. And they were just making things happen and, you know, selling thousands and thousands of donuts without any real systems or processes or thoughts. They were just making it happen. And uh, I was so impressed with the team. Like, these people were so committed to voodoo. Um, that I was like, holy cow, this is, you know, if I could do this now one more time, and not that I'm in my career, but, um, you know, we, we had grown it. Uh, we had grown mod. We'd, I'd been part of the Starbucks growth. Could I do it again? Right. right. It was kind of this challenge of could I do it again, right? Could I do it now as a CEO 
where ultimately the buck did stop with me and could I do it and, and, and did I have the skill set and did I have the mentors around me to be able to make that happen and uh, and so it was one of those things where I challenged myself right to could it happen and so um, I'm curious what were the things about you the things that you knew you possessed aside from you know the actual experience that yeah. the years put in what made you think that you could do it again like and what was that's your, a great question yeah. I've never really asked myself that I'm, I'm kind of self-reflecting right um, and, and I, uh, I I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about me and how I how kind of leader I want to be and um, and part of it was I just knew that that um, I'm an operator right I'm not the marketing person I'm, I'm I'm not the finance person I'm a black and white roll up my sleeves operator that's who I am that's what you get with Chris who is that person paint that picture um, that's a person that you know I was a CEO of the dish pit when I was 16 years old right <laughs> I mean that's what I, that's how I thought about it right and 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 I know when I when I when I focus if I have a bad day and I think we talked about this last one if I'm having a bad day I go down to the donut shop and I work I literally put on a t-shirt and I go back in the back and I talk to the staff and we have fun and we laugh and we giggle we talk about people's lives how are things going because it reminds me that it wasn't so long ago that I was that person mm. and it wasn't so long ago that I wasn't slinging dishes or, or making pizzas or making coffee or whatever that looks like. Um, and it was a good reminder for me, right? It's a great reminder, great grounder for me. So for me, the way I look at myself is that I, I love being in the restaurants and not because I can proof my feathers, like I said, strutting my stuff out in front of the restaurant where I got the reality check, um, but more about being in, being in the weeds with people, right? There, I, I don't know. There's a study that went out there that was like 60 or 65% of all uh, Americans' first job was in a restaurant somewhere. Right. Right? It's huge. It's huge. Yes. Um, and for me, you know, that's all I've ever known, right? So it's yeah. like the great painter who just goes and paints, right, and just gets in his own. I gig on people, right? I gig on action and movement and people. Um, you know, Howard Bihar talks about the walls talk, right? Yeah. You walk in a place, you know good things are happening. Or you walk in a place, you're like, I don't even know what's happening, but there's something going it's on. It's subtle. I mean, it's the low road of communication, the things that we're not even conscious of that are being picked up on, you know? Absolutely. And it's just all their influence. Absolutely. And oh. so for me, I, you know, I, I prefer... I'm an operator. Now, I'm smart enough to know that i got to surround myself with great marketing people and great financial people. I, I know it. I can do it. But I, that's not my core competency. And yeah. So i got to go find those really good folks. So one of the, the things I got from you when I asked, like, so what is it that makes you an operator? I think it's knowing that, you, like, that that's your happy place. Knowing that at the end of the day, when you need to get go back into the place that makes you happy, it's with your people, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. But what skills does a good operator need? What are the things that you have the, yeah. that you possess that make you an operator? you got to be tenacious. Okay. Right? Failure's not an option. you got to be yeah. tenacious. Yeah. You have to have drive. Um, you got to be authentic. Okay. Right? I'm an authentic leader. Yeah. You're going to get what you're going to get from me yeah. every day of the week, right? Uh, one, one of the, again, one of my mentors taught me a long time ago, I can't have a bad day. Yeah. I cannot have a bad day, right? So it's and optimism. You have to. Internal. You, you know? have to, right? You Indefinite. Just, optimism. You, just, you do. <laughs> you just have to. I mean, I, I literally, if, even if I, I can't have a bad day. Yeah. If I go in a restaurant, right? If I go to, I just can't have a bad day. Yeah. And I'm a people person, right? I enjoy being out with people and being around people. And uh, I just gig on that, right? It's yeah. part of my DNA. And, yeah. and uh, you know, from a very young kid growing up, I work hard, right? I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I always, my dad always taught me is you don't have to be smarter than everybody, but outwork everybody. Yes. And so, um, so that's just kind of take, taking that on probably to an extreme sometimes. And sometimes people check me and say, well, hold on a minute. You got to take a day off. But, uh, but I, yeah, the operator for me is tenacious, optimistic, right? Optimistic. There's always a better day, right? You have a bad it. sales day. Tomorrow's going to get better. Let's figure yeah. out we're going to get it better tomorrow. Yeah. And then, and then also authentic and committed, right? I mean, I think those are, those are the key points. Man, of being you're a great painting operator. the picture. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I wanted. You also mentioned um, that this opportunity was just something that you couldn't pass up. I think I identified that what it was is like you said, the walls talk. It's a cultural thing, right? It the is. The cult following was what made you identified this as being an organization that had a cult following. So you also said that that it was these people, Trace and Cat Daddy, the original founders, right? Yeah. I'm saying that correctly. Um, yeah. They they were marketers and that's where they were amazing. They were amazing at developing this brand. So what is it that an, an, an establishment needs? What have you identified that it takes to create this cult following? What yeah. did they do well up to this point that you identified? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. One is, is, as we talked about, right, they were great marketers, 
but they didn't surround themselves with great operators and great financial people, right? So one of the mistakes they made, and we'll talk, we'll talk about, I'll answer your question. One of the mistakes they had made as they grew the business was they were great in their area of opportunity, but they, they, did, they weren't self-reflecting enough to understand, okay, well, we're great at this, so let's go get a great operator. Let's go get a great financial person. Let's go get great people around us that can fulfill those needs, and, 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 and then the bucket gets full, right? Mm. Um, but in marketing, what they did was they were very authentic, right? They never, they never wavered from who they wanted to be just because the street said, well, you have to do this or you have to do that. They were just authentic. Right, they they made crazy donuts and they were going to make crazy donuts. They they put Nyquil on a donut because they thought it was fun and wacky <laughs> until the government came in and said, "Wait a minute, that little thing on the on the bottle yeah. isn't a recommendation. That's a requirement." <laughs> um, and part of their validation was, you know, Universe Studios uh, came to them and said, "We want to put you on CityWalk." Right. Yeah. So, what other validation do you have about the brand as a cult brand when a when a business like Universe Studios says, "Hey, we're we're in CityWalk when they have so many spaces, we'd love to bring Voodoo Donut in." Right, and so now they're in Orlando and LA, and they're great partners to work with. They're 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 they they present the brand really well and, and do really well with the brand. So, it's part of that growth, right? But they were they were really focused on being authentic, really focused on on staying wacky, right? Yep. Having a little of Portland Portland ethos and everything they've done, you know, um, keep, keeping it weird, keeping it weird, right? <laughs> um, a little bit of ethos of, of Portland in every store, right? Uh, and in, in the queues, you know, when I went and visited the stores when I originally came to Voodoo. I got a chance to go visit stores, and obviously downtown Portland's a, a not a need, right? It's an anomaly. It's not, if you take that, it, and again, I was, my mentor shared with me, you know, it's like having their first Starbucks store. If that's, that's not the business. Yeah. That's, that's really Wonka, right? <laughs> I mean, when you take the first Voodoo Donut store in downtown Portland, that's, that's an anomaly, right? That's not the business. That's just Willy Wonka's factory and, and tourists, and it's crazy. And they yeah. do crazy numbers. <laughs> but when you look outside that, the other stores are doing very well. Yeah. Right? And, we're in Austin, and we're in Denver, and we're in Eugene, and, and they had done really well. And so, uh, but they again, they just couldn't figure out how to take that next step, right? They'd open a few stores. They were feeling pretty good about it, but it was like six years between opening stores, and, and they had a lot of good people leave the business because they wanted to grow, and they were like, well, there's unless the person above me quits, there's nowhere for me to go. Yes, yeah, so there's some things I need to pull out of what you just share with yeah, us. Yeah, please. And I just ramble. No, man, mm-hmm. it's beautiful, and that's what you're here to do. You're here to talk. We're here to listen. Uh, but the, the big thing I identified, and something that I've just recently come to terms with, and it's helped me a lot in kind of trying to figure out what I've learned, that for a while I've been so overwhelmed with the things you need to know to be successful, and for a while I'm like, you need to be good at all these things. Like, how is it possible <laughs> to be good at all these things? But right. the truth of the matter is there's a million different ways to get from where you start to where you finish and become successful. And the, the, the way to do it is to do what you do best. And it sounds like what these people did best was their marketing. And they leaned into their strength for as long as possible. And they got it as far as they could until they got to the, the point where they could attract onto themselves the people that were strong where they were weak. Right. right? And, that's a and, great point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's kind of a trend that I've seen. And, and, they, and I'm seeing it again right here. And you don't have to be good at everything, but you do have to know what you're good at. Right. And you do have to do it better than anybody else. And then right. you can use that strength to attract onto yourself other people. Right. And, and, and maximize it, right? Yeah. Maximize it, maximize it, maximize it. Um, you know, and, and, and listen, we're all dreamers, right? We all dream. You know, I can tell you when I was probably 12 years old, I dreamed of, you know, I was working. What was I going to be? I was going to be a baseball player. Okay, that didn't work, right? <laughs> What's next? I'm going to be a fire. That didn't work, right? Now I'm in a restaurant. And throughout my career, I, I, I aspired to be a CEO or run a company or, you know, do my own thing. And and, uh, and the reality was I realized, listen, I'm not, a, I'm not a visionary, like an entrepreneurial visionary guy where I'm going to come up with a concept, right? Other people can do that. But yeah. boy, I can run the hell out of them once they get it, once we figure out what they're doing. I need a Chris Schultz in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing you mentioned during our first interview that I picked up, that my ear caught, that I wish I went deeper into was the fact that you said you were a great coach. And I think yeah. being a great coach is something that a great operator is. Yeah. Um, so what is a great coach? Yeah. Take us through how your coaching Empathy. Style. Okay. Empathy for your team. Empathy, um, treating people like individuals, um, always having a plan, right? A team, uh, and I'll give you a great example. We're sitting here in Houston, uh, and we had a, an amazing opening, like beyond reality. It was an hour and a half wait for Donuts in Line. It was a two-hour wait in a drive through and I was scheduled to leave the day after opening, right? And so I get all the way down the airport. I literally say goodbye to the team here, and I get to the airport. I check in, and I go right to the, right to the gate to get on the plane, and literally they're calling my gate to, to board, and I think to myself, you can't leave. You just can't leave, right? 
The captain doesn't leave. He doesn't leave. He can't leave. He or she can't leave. So I literally just stepped away. I called United. And I got an Uber, and I called United and said, I'm not getting on a plane. I don't know when I'm going to go back to Portland. Can you please extend it? And I got right back to the store, and I've been here now for the next five days. And listen, that's not patting myself on the back, but when you ask about a great coach, a great coach never leaves, right? A great coach is there in the middle of it. You can be a great – when you're winning, it's easy to be a great coach, right? It's not – you don't see the guy on TV when they're winning. You see the guy on the losing and how he's reacting, how he or she's responding to it, um, and how how they're reacting and how they're getting their team motivated around it. And so, you know, you can have a successful open like this, but that doesn't mean the team's having success, right? They're in the weeds yeah. 24-7. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I think for me it's, it's being tenacious, again, going back to the same thing. It's also never leaving, right? Yes. Being committed enough to stand beside them and, and leading for the front. It's funny um, – Every month I have a, a conversation with all of our general managers, and it's great, great time. Tomorrow's, tomorrow's the call with them, and tomorrow we're talking about leading from the front. Yes, pulling right. instead of pushing, right? Right, lead from the front, right? Don't sit in the office to be the manager. Don't sit in the ivory tower to be the manager. You want to be a leader? Get up in front with your team, right? Let them see you. That doesn't mean you have to be – I'm not washing dishes. But I am certainly standing by the dishwasher telling them what a great job they're doing. Yeah. You know, are they showing, like, p- painting that picture of perfection, right? And you right. have to be in the front for everybody to see what that, yeah. for, what that, what that looks and then, like. And then also identifying folks who just don't fit, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a hard conversation. I'm sure, you know, many times people don't have, we don't have this kind of dialogue where not everyone's a fit. And you have to, as a good coach, identify when they're not a fit and move quickly to move them out because they're, they're impacting the team. Right. Right. So the, in success of the team. So the big things I identified, uh, I have identified, are uh, not being able to or not being willing to quit. Always being there, right? Empathy. You said in the very beginning, um, knowing who isn't a good fit, right? And what else did we say? Um, always, like, always being there. Right? Le- leading from the front. Leading from the front. Leading yeah. from the front. We, we might have. Yeah, leading, a couple, from, leading from the front. They're all in there. Somewhere. Yeah, they're all in there somewhere. <laughs> and sometimes I'm known to kind of ramble, and, and no, it, you know, great. I've been here in, in, at the store now. I think for. 12 days or something. Um, and so, you know, but but the reality is I look at it is my job as the CEO or as the head coach, right, is to motivate the team to, do best, to be the best they can be. Mm. And the reality is some are better than others, and that's great, but they're all part of the mechanism that moves the team forward. Yeah. Um, and my and always having a plan, right? I always have a plan to think through, okay, what if this happens? What if that happens? That's a great coach. Backups. They're never, you're never surprised, right? Yeah. And, and for me, a great coach is never surprised yeah. by something that happens. The way I'm thinking about it, because your, your sport was baseball, right? Yeah. So you got to teach your team what happens if the shortstop misses the ball. Like what happens if he pulls, breaks his ankle? Exactly. Right? But what's your backup plan? What's right? your backup plan? You know that the left fielder is going to back up. This, the, you know, like and if yeah. who's going to back up the left fielder if they miss it? Yeah. The, the center fielder, yeah. right? But you have to have these scenarios, and you yeah. have to like p- paint these pictures of like if this, then that. And right? I think in the millennial world today, you're seeing you know different kind of coaches. That, you know, and I'll, I'll use sports analogies because that's just kind of near and dear to my heart. But you know, you have different kind of coaches. You know, Pete Carroll with the Seahawks is a rah rah, this boom ba guy, right? He gets the best out of his team. Bill Belichick's a little more disciplinarian, right? right? He's a little more disciplinarian, right? (laughs) Um, But you watch these guys, and and, and I'm an astute student of watching coaches and how they put their teams together and how they motivate their teams and how there's no excuses, right? Coaches don't make excuses. Coaches fix things and provide solutions. Provide solutions, exactly. So if we have an issue and we have an error, we just own it, right? And And a coach is the first to own it. Yes. He is the first one to say up and say, we made a mistake there. To my team, and I'm like, we made a mistake. I own it. I'm sorry. Here's what we have to do to fix it. Here's how we're going to fix it. What's the power of owning it? What, what's going on when that, when that happens? Uh, I think, you know, I think from, a, from, my, from my seat, from my side, owning it gives me comfort because, because at the end of the day, um, I have to have trust, right? Trust. I have to trust my employees, our employees. Our employees have to trust me. Our leadership has to trust me. Our, our investors need to trust me. I need to trust them, right? So, you know, I, I also recognize just because I'm the CEO, I've been doing this a long time. I'm not Superman, right? I got to know my limits, yeah. right? And I got to know and I got to understand um, at the end of the day, I'm just a person. I just have to be in the restaurant business. Um, but I gig it, right? I love being in the restaurant business. It's what I do. It's who I am. And I recognize tomorrow I, I couldn't go to work for the Gap. I, I couldn't do that at the retail side of business. I, li- I like to feed people. Yeah. I like to see people leave happy. I like to see our employees leave. I, and so I think that, that comes across to the team, and they understand directly every time 
just who I am, right? I say good morning to everybody. It's a really, it's a niche for I me, love it. right? Good morning to everybody. Well, you actually see them, you know, and it shows. It's like there's a the this African word, and it, it translates to hello. It's like it's like hello, but it means I see you. It's it's like this tribe in Africa. I can't remember what the word actually yeah. is, but it literally it's like how they say hello, but it translates literally into I see you, and that's what you're saying when you say good morning. I think you know? so. Like yeah, I think th- yeah. We need to be seen. We need to be yeah. recognized. But you know, we, listen, we learned it as kids. You said hello. You said thank you. Yeah. Why does it stop when you're 25 years old? Why is it okay to I don't stop? Know. Right. I mean, in the world we live in, we're just becoming more and more transactional. I don't like it. Totally. <laughs> People are looking at their phones and they're moving yeah. around, right? No one, no one's taking the time to say hello or goodbye or thank you or, you know, the the word thank you. The re- we talked about this before. Gratitude is such a powerful. Yes. Such a powerful emotion, um, and and I'm in I'm in I'm internally grateful. To, to everybody that's contributed to my success. But you got to show it. you got to communicate it. So oh, you yeah, have and, to. And by just saying good morning is just a simple thing you could do. I think so. To, tr- to communicate that. And we started this, this section of the conversation by talking about um, the why um, it's so important to be uh, honest, I think. Right? We're talking yeah. about honesty. You know, owning it. That was what owning we were talking it. about. Yeah. Owning it. And, and when you own it, um, and the reason why I just said honesty, I got that confused because during our first interview, I asked you, like, what's one quality every leader needs? And you said honesty. Yeah. But when you're honest and you're open you're, and, and you admit your vulnerabilities when you do something wrong and you effed up, right. you know, like, people are going to be like, okay, like, it's like a dog. And I use this analogy all the time, yeah. rolling over and showing its belly, yeah. and showing its weakness. And that instantly, in that moment, you gain you gain trust. It's so powerful. I uh, believe so. Yeah. I believe so. So... Back to the, yeah. the 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 trunk of the conversation. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> no, I got I got rambling. No, this is all, we we go out, we come back in. Yeah, um, I asked you about coaching. The reason why I asked you about coaching was because I'm curious. How have you coached Voodoo Donut in the past two years? Yeah. So like you said, you said you coached by leading from the front, right? So what were the things that you saw Voodoo needed that they did not have? That you coach them, that you coach into the operation. Yeah, so so Voodoo again, you know, we we produce all of our donuts in in the shop, right? And so we're we're a production kitchen with a counter. And 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 the reality was, I think in in the early days, they were so focused in production, and then let the two founders kind of market the brand, right? And what I brought forward when I came to Voodoo was. It's got to be about the experience, right? Mm. It's got to be so about the happy experience, you're right? Mentioning this. Dude, I mean, the reality is today I can get the best restaurant in the world delivered to my couch yes. with one push of a button. So why am I going to get off the couch? Today it's raining here in Houston. There's a line out the door, right? Yeah. What is forcing these people to get off the couch and drive in the rain, park their cars, stand in line? I'm, I'm just going to do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, Jared's yeah. going to hate yeah. me for moving the camera. Yeah. I'm just going to. Um, but what's going to make you do that, right? You got to be authentic. You got to be honest, and so, and it's got to be about the experience, right? The experience is differentiates everything. Um, we have really quality donuts, and 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 I would say I would challenge some of the best donuts in the business. But that's just the entrance fee, yeah. right? If we don't have good product, we're not even in the game. Yes. But but now, what separates you, right? It's about the experience. The experience when you walk in, the environment, the music the decorum in the restaurant, how you're treated. And so for me, I've really focused to coach the team around the experience. How can we elevate the experience of Voodoo? How do we understand what the experience looks like? So, so what are the three things that you did? Narrow it down to three things you did to elevate the experience. Yeah, so we listen to our customers. Okay. So every single morning, uh, we now get a report for every social media comment that goes out on Voodoo. So we had to reflect sometimes because it's not always, I'll tell you, some mornings I wake up and I read that list and I'm like, Oh man, we had a bad day. So you listen to the customers, number one. Um, yeah. And what ways are you listening to the customers? So we, so again, we, we, we roll up as I said all the social media reviews, right? Okay. From Yelp and from Google and from analysts. We do, we do a roll up every morning of every every review we've gotten for the day before. We send those out to every store manager. So total transparency, right? Yep. Because everyone's seeing everybody else's reviews, right? Um, and we have to we have to own that. Right, we've got to read that and own that because we all love the good ones, right? You're a five star, you're awesome. We don't like the twos and threes, and the two threes and the ones. We're like, ah, well, they they just don't get it. Yeah. No, they get it. <laughs> we didn't get it, right? So that was one, right? Was yeah. listening to the customers. Yeah. Make sure we listen to customers. Make sure, you know, we're not always reactive to it because we can't react to every single comment. But but the reality is, you got to listen to what your customers are telling you. Yeah, I mean, when you have how many stores now? We've got nine now, right? That's a lot of. That's a lot of. 
channels of communication, right? It is, and and, and we and, you know we know today with social media, and social media, you know, and Yelp, everyone's a food critic now, yeah. and, that, and that's okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I know I'm probably going to go against some of the people that think differently than I do in the restaurant business. I like that. <laughs> I like the fact that everyone can review me, right? Yeah. It's going to be a report card. It's data. I get a report card every single yeah. morning on how we did yesterday. Yes. I get one report card with the financials. I mean, and the other report card from our customers. Yeah, I mean, but you talk. I mean, it, it's basically it's it's tracking, right? And you get this is free information that it you, is. you it wouldn't is. otherwise be able. People used to put boxes up; they still do. You right, can still do comment that. boxes. But yeah. now, like, it's just like already there. You don't have to ask for it; it's right. there. It's there. So, it, so we do that. So, number one, um, you listen. Right. Number two, well, the, these are the the three things that you yeah. do to create a better experience. We number also, two. I also listen to the employees. Okay, right. So, constantly get feedback from the team. How are we doing? What are we doing? Ooh. So we run. You know, we run uh, employee satisfaction surveys in our stores once a quarter because we're, we're trying to capture how are we doing as an employer, right? Are we giving you the things you need? So as an example, uh, we now offer pet insurance. It sounds so small and so different, um, but the reality was when we did our benefits, our team said, we'd like to get health care for our dogs and our cats and our pets. And I was like, never, never hit my mind. I was like, well, let's do that for them, right? Let's make that work. And it sounds so small. But I'll tell you, just including that was a big win for the team. So and yeah, I mean, but the, the the impact, you know, and that's what you can't overlook is what are you willing to do to make people happy? And we don't talk to our employees enough, and they are just they're another piece of data, right? And the other thing is when we talk to them, they might have the problem and the solution, right? And you're tapping into another source of energy to to be a potential problem solver. You know, why you're employing all these people? Think of each brain as a pot, like a battery, right? And the more brains you can plug into, the more potential energy you have. And Why cut yourself short of that? And not, but think about it as well. They're all representing me. Yeah. Right. I'm not on the counter, so the four people that work at the counter here today, they're all representing the brand. They're representing me, and and you got to listen to them, right? You can't. Yeah. They're not robots, right? I wasn't a robot when I was working in the restaurant. You want to be heard. I would love to, when I was working to tell the owner, "Hey, my name's Chris. Can you tell someone to call me Chris?" And but back in the day, that was just the way it was. And I think today, you got to listen. Yeah. Um, so listen. So listen to our customers. Listen to your your employees. Listen to our employees. And so is that one and two? That's one and two. Okay. And one what, and two. What's the third thing? That's interesting. The third thing. Um, don't don't get too high or low on any given day. So you have a great sales day. Let's you know. Be careful not to read your press clippings only in good days, right? So we have great sales days. Um, I don't get too high or too low on, on, on sales, right? I know it all normalize out. So I don't get on the team too much when we've had a bad sales week, right? We talk about it. We talk about why and what's going to happen next. Um, but as long as you're trending upward and you're moving and, and there's momentum, you're having success. And, and I think so many times, you know, in my seat, we focus so much on the numbers. The numbers are only going to drive us and drive every conversation is the numbers. I think if you if you drive around people and, and product that first, people, product, and process, right? You're, the numbers are going to be there, and, and if you have to adjust, you have to adjust. But um, for me, I, I don't get too high or too low so as an organization. You're, I think it sounds like what you, the reason why you're bringing this to the conversation is that if you if you're following the numbers too close and you have a, a bad numbers day and it's a it's a Tuesday afternoon and it's raining out, right? Um, you're going to let those numbers influence your presence, right? Right, and then that presence. Is then going to influence everybody around you? Is that, yeah, I think I, absolutely. Is absolutely. that the yeah, connection? absolutely? And I, I, I would caveat that with it as well as we talk to employees. So my cell phone number is up in every store by the schedule. My personal cell phone number. Yeah. And so I share with the team if if culturally we're not doing what we said we're going to do, and we're not tr- we're not treating you in the, in the cultural way. Call me. Yeah. Call me. And, and I have your cell phone number. Dis- I'll put that in the show that notes for everybody. That calls from the dishwasher <laughs> to the dishwasher to the. I, it, it's okay. Call me at any time, um, because that's what I committed to as an operator, right? That's what I committed to, and as a coach, yeah, that's what coaches it. do, right? Um, so uh, you know, I've learned that, and I've learned through my years as well as to. I'm, I'm I've learned to be a good delegator, right? We talked about this already. Um, you know, I try to do everything myself. I realize sometimes I can't. Yeah, and I learned that at Mod, right? As Mod grew, right, there was just too much, so. Part of the part of bringing it to, to to Voodoo was let's make sure we like we give people the tools to do a good job and let them run. Yeah. What's right? the secret to being a good delegator? Uh, you know, not being too full of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's good. I That's mean, good. listen, I I always think I can do things better than everybody else. Always. If you're the, I think I could have built this thing better than the construction guys, <laughs> but I know I can't. Right. I don't know how to build a, the yeah. restaurant. Um, 
but don't doubt it. I won't come in and go, why is that ball a little crooked? <laughs> um, but I also just don't be too full of yourself sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think as you grow and especially in this business, as you become upper senior level management, sometimes you start to, you start to believe in, in your own clippings, right? Read yep. your own clippings. And sometimes I think it becomes almost self-fulfilling, right? Because now you have a little bit of success, and now you think everything you say, boy, I have the magic, right? Um, and I'm not sure that's always true. Yeah. Man, I've been loving this. So um, just to summarize real quick, the three things. One was to listen to your guests. Two, listen to your employees. And three was remind me of the, the – Yeah, summarize. don't have to – don't get too high or too low based on numbers, right? Yes. Don't, don't, you know, don't let that dig don't, – don't dive so deep into numbers that you forget about one and two. Yeah. And these are the ways to create a good, great experience. And there's one more I want to throw on there. I think – is just the the creativity that, that went into displaying, right? Yeah. And like we just sometimes we just put things in a counter and we go, there we go. Right. But you guys have you walk in this the space is, is pretty there's there's a cued line, right? And along the line there's um, you have a whole display of the swag that right. you guys the, yeah. the hats and the shirts. These are all parts of the experience while you're waiting. Like you're now you're shopping while you're in line, right? And then beyond that you get and like there's a spinning and um, I'll even I'll, I'll yeah, jewel case, right? Because the donuts are jewels. Yeah, you get you get these uh, donuts in a jewel case that's spinning, right? And you're getting creative, and and it, that's every little, all these like little details. You can you have this open, beautiful kitchen behind you, right? Where you can see, and there's a window that you can like look in and see the process of right. how things are made. Right. These all tie into uh, these all tie into experience, right? And yeah, I just wanted I th- to yeah, point out those so. things. Yeah, too. I think so. I mean, listen, I think that that you know we we all you know you go somewhere, you leave, and you're like. And I think I read a study one time that, that people always forget what they ate, but they won't forget the, how yes. they felt. Yeah, right? I mean, you and walk into this place, the music's bumping, right? Right, and, and, and we don't choose the music, so we let our team choose the music. I love so the we, have, we have guidelines, <laughs> and so um, they come in, write their name on a list, and they get to play their music for the hour, and the next person plays their music for the hour, and the next person, again, letting people be people, right? Yep. And as long as we give them some guidelines and some, some curbs, they're, they're pretty good Ooh. about it. I'm going to segue off of that in yeah. two seconds. Um, actually, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to get right into it. Uh, when the last interview, you talked about these lines that you established, right? And yeah. you're pretty much loose when it comes to the rules, but there's yeah. some some of the lines that you just you establish and you yeah. don't cross. Yeah. The the three lines I think you had that you shared with us before were lying, cheating, and stealing. Yeah. I'm sure you probably carried those values over. Yeah. Um, what are the new lines? Have you created yeah, any new lines? Yeah, voodoo. Yeah. yeah, voodoo, no surprises. No surprises. No surprises. What's that mean? It means, you know, again, we'll be transparent with you. You be transparent with us. If you're having a bad day at work, you have a bad day. At, sorry, if you have a bad day at home or you've got struggles that are impacting your ability to be a great employer or, or, or work, um, let us know, mm. right? If you can't make it to work because your car got towed, I just was talking to one of our folks in the back. Her car got towed two days ago. It's now in the impound lot. She's taking an Uber to work, right, because she can't afford to get a car on the impound lot. Because I saw her on the back, and she just wasn't looking happy. I was like, what's going on? And she shared that story, right? And I was like, we talk about no surprises. Tell us. And so I got the GM. We're going to go get our car to the impound lot today. We're going to pay the fee. Listen, and this isn't, everyone does this. So this isn't so unique for Voodoo. But we're going to go get her car to the lot. We're going to make sure she gets her car back. We're going to put her back in a spot where she can be successful, mm. right? Um, so for me, it's no surprise of Voodoo, right? Just no surprises, right? Let's, let's all... It's all just be open and honest about what's happening in our lives and our world. Yeah, you know, and you're creating that culture again. Like culture is reality, perception right. is reality. And what you're saying is like, listen, life happens. We get it, right? And we we we, we understand. And communicating that you understand, and communicating, letting them know they're not going to lose their job if for whatever <laughs> serious of, event. But right. what we won't understand is you not letting us know, letting us know exactly. And, and, and but you got to you got to communicate that. Yeah. Um. So and important. I think it's important. And, and I and I'm sure there's people that listen to podcasts go, well, Chris, you know, I have a thousand employees or two thousand employees. How do I do that? Right. You, you know, you've got a company that's 300 employees. It sounds pretty simple with 300 employees. I would tell you, if you can't do it at a thousand employees, then you, you got to figure out a way. Right. Delegate the responsibility. Do whatever you need to do because I will. I, I think you get more committed employees. I think the customers know when they're committed. They yeah. get it, right? They buy, in. they buy in. And again, what's going to get them off the couch on a rainy Tuesday in Houston, Wednesday in Houston, to come down and try the Voodoo Donut? It's because the experience. I mean, people are sitting around eating donuts at I don't know what time it's almost it's, noon, it's, right? Yeah, it's almost noon, and we still aligned it. So. I saw a table of five ladies sit at, <laughs> at this table that we're at for an hour and a half. Eating donuts. When was the last time anybody went out and ate donuts for an hour? Yeah, and a half? no, it's just it's an environment that they <laughs> like to be in, uh, yeah. and and we've had a really good time. I mean, we've had a, a probably a once in a lifetime kind of experience here in Houston, our first store in Houston. 
Uh, we built a drive through which we never did before. But again, talk about failures on option. Um, Voodoo never built a drive through We took this building and had a drive through window. And, and the entire company said, well, we've never done drive through before. And I said, yeah, but it has a window. So we're doing now we're in the drive through business, right? Yeah. And so failures on option. Yeah. Figure it out, yeah. right? Figure it out. We can hire three more people to work the drive through 24 hours a day, we're open the drive through up. And, and people are like, well, we, there's, Chris, there's no way. And, but then again, that mentality kicks in. We're phase on option. We'll figure out how to do drive There's no way figure, right now. Right now. We'll, until yeah, we find a way. Until we find a way. And <laughs> yeah. So um, it's been it's been a success. And yeah. it's really it's really allowed, again, some of the creativity to, to explore. Yeah. One more thing I want to pull to the surface that yeah. came out of what you shared with us is uh, when you were talking about the music, right? And believe it or not, this music, you can hear it in the background. Uh, I when I came in, I was like, "If this where the music was is a ten, can we bring it down to a seven? Yeah. So even what you're hearing in the background is not a real like representation of how much it bumps in here. Yeah, it does. but, but yeah. I think the, the, what I wanted to point out was that um, like g- giving loose guidelines, right? So when you're when you're too restrictive, you, your people can't be individuals, right? Because you put too many rules in place. But what you can do is say, "Be yourself," and just. But just don't cross this line. Don't let there be cursing. Don't right. let there be whatever in exactly. the music. Like, what's the power of giving them that that creative freedom? And just and how like what's the art of like balancing creative freedom without ma- with the yeah? Without what I mayhem? tell them is simply do the right thing. Yeah. you knew what the right thing was. Yeah. as a kid, right? If I tell you do the right thing when you play the music, simply do the right thing. You're an adult. We all know those rules. Um, and it's listen. I have to explain. Here's the here are their guidelines. Is that the right thing to do? I'm yeah. really going to look at you and go, is that the right thing to do? And you're yeah. going to have to say to me, I know it's not. Well, okay. <laughs> then why are we having the conversation? <laughs> yeah. It's not the right thing I, to I do, it, right? Yeah. Simply. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I preach to the team all the time, whether it's dealing with a customer or the music or dealing with a, a, another a, a co- em, co-employee, right? Someone, one of their peers and they're having a disagreement. What's the right thing to do, right? Um, I teach my, my executive team, who I've got a great team surrounding me now, um, simply do the right thing. I know what the book says. I get it. But what's the right thing to do? Yeah, man. And, and, and man, oh, man. I mean, I you know, life's too short not to do the right thing. I, I don't want to be part of a business. I don't want to be part of the business. I don't want to lead a business where the, we're going to be guided by a rule book. Right? Yeah. No, I feel you. Um, I've loved this conversation. Is there anything we have not gotten to that you were hoping we would discuss? Something that's unique to your experience at Voodoo that did not come to the service yet. Now's the time. You know, I guess for me, it's it's uh, you know, it's going back to, to being authentic, right? I mean, you know, there's so many restaurants now opening throughout the country, and, and I had a, a, a real pleasure, I don't know, four or five months back, I spoke at a conference in Salt Lake City for, for folks with one or two restaurants that were looking to grow and kind of what's the magic, right? And one of the things I left with them was, um, number one, be authentic, right? Yeah. Be authentic, right? If you're building a brand simply because you want to make a bunch of money, do me a favor and don't do it. <laughs> Go do something Why else. Why not? Right? Go do something else, Why right? Because um, there's just the, the reality is I think people will see through it. And the reality is you're taking up space and time and energy and employees yeah. and real estate. That, that quite frankly we don't um, want you in this industry no just go do something <laughs> yeah. else right just go do something else I mean be authentic but the, the if I can compound yeah. off of that um, when this comes up in conversation the, the power of authenticity instead of like people do, like you're saying they'll just build a brand because right. it's just the idea it's a creation right. but the thing is the difference between doing that and being authentic is you can show up every day to who you are right and you don't have to put the brand on you don't have to put the face on right. you just and that alone makes it so much easier to show yeah. up every no day. yeah absolutely and, and then the other part you know is listen the restaurant business is hard it's hard yeah and if anyone's going to fool themselves think the restaurant business well gosh i've had a little success with a couple of stores and you know i can grow my business because look at all the success i'm having all i need is more financing check yourself right it's not always great to, to have 10 15 20 stores Sometimes it's okay to have two or three or four. Yeah. That's just great. Yeah, and just delivering, right? Um, because it's not for the you know it's not for the faint of heart, right? It, it's long, hard hours. Um, a lot of people are meant to do it. A lot of people aren't meant to do it. And you know, I'm constantly challenged by by folks who, you know, I've got this great idea and and I think I can go do this. And I, I wanna I wanna be the next McDonald's. I wanna be the next Starbucks. I wanna be the next Mod Pizza, right? Um, you know, Voodoo here today. We're we're growing the business. Um, you know, I fully expect to open four or five stores this year, 
but that's it, right? And maybe four or five next year, but super exclusive, right? Yeah, well, you mentioned this in the first interview. You said, you know, when you went to mod, you, your intent was to, to grow slowly. And when you <laughs> right. grow slowly, you have four walls economics. Or was that right. what you said, four walls economics? Is that well, as long, as long as the four wall economics work, you can continue to grow. So what, and, you know, that was something I, I identified yeah. by. Like, what exactly do you mean by four walls economics? Yeah. Why does growing slowly provide you for not walls Well, economics? it provides you provides you better insight, right? Okay. When I talk about four-wall economics, I, I think about the, the stores being the four walls of the stores, right? As long as I continue to build stores where economically those four walls work, right? They work. So and as long as the economics within those four walls are working, at any point, if the, the economics in any one of the four walls of any of the buildings you right. own aren't working... you got to figure it out. You better slow down. So you, Yeah, so you're basically looking at the numbers. The numbers will tell you when to scale. I always say cash flow and people determine scale. So is that what you mean by yeah, four walls I economics? Yeah, like, I think so a little bit. Um, you know, listen, the reality is... The overhead's another another variable. You talk forever for overheads, yeah. right? But but I look at each store as its own business, right? And and for me, it's really understanding, okay, can the four walls operate? And are they making money inside those four walls? And can they fund the next the next growth? And yeah. if not, where do we need to get to to, to fund that growth, yeah. right? And, um, and, then, and then layer in, you know, today we're, we have, I think, seven people in our corporate headquarters. Um, which I even I hate that term. I, if anyone has a great term for a corporate headquarters, please let me know. Um, in the UK, they call it the home office. Uh, Starbucks called the support center. Uh, I just hate headquarters. I just that, that term just feels so corporate to me. Um, I, I will brainstorm a solution. Please, yeah, please. If anyone has a great idea, email me. Yeah, uh, the great idea. But um, but uh, you know, as long as those four walls work, the economics of the four walls work. So we're growing now because. You know, I didn't grow in the first year, right? I just was kind of figuring out, okay, what do we have in the business, right? And do we have the right people? Do we have the right processes? So for a year, we didn't do anything, right? I just kind of sat around. I'm sure people were like, well, Chris is over there. We were recognized one of the, you know, the up-and-coming brands when I first joined Voodoo. And then year two, we weren't in the up-and-coming brands because we hadn't grown. And I think people just assume I was going to, you know, full throttle the moment I arrived. And we just had to get the business right. Yeah, we had you know, to get the business I, right. I love it. And like when you, we started this, this conversation by saying when when you came on Voodoo, um, they didn't have room for growth, right? And I think that kind of ties back into the four walls economic. Like, yeah. how do you know when to grow? Like, well, are the numbers showing that it's time? But the other thing is like, do we have no place to put people? Right. And that's the point. That's yeah. the biggest point, Eric. And I then, mean, that's the deal. And that's when you open the next restaurant, when you're going to lose, like when you need, when you run out of place for people. Correct. You know, we, we all we all have great people in our stores, in our restaurants, in our shops, whatever you want to call them. If you're not helping them grow, the reality is you're going to lose them. Yes. You're going to lose them. Yep. Right. It's just a matter of time. And you can continue to pay them, but... But at a certain point in time, pay becomes a moot point, right? Yep. They want to develop as individuals. They want to grow as individuals. Yeah. And I think it's our job as business owners and business leaders to give people the, the opportunity to grow, to become the next me, right, yeah. from the restaurant business, right? And so if you're not doing that, if you're just doing it purely to make a bunch of money, then I'll be honest with you, go do, please go do something else. Yes. Please, please, it. please I love do it. something else. So this is a question I've been asking all yeah. my guests before going to the speed rounds. New yeah. question. The mission statement of the show is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. Um, so how have you transformed in the, let's go back, I don't know, from your time over at Starbucks yeah. to the man you are today, how have you transformed? Oh, God, I'm a, di- I'm a totally different person, <laughs> right? Um, I'm a little bit calmer. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a little bit more confident. Um, uh, it's not all about me. I will tell you there was points in time in my career where it was all about me and my growth and how I could become the next rung, right? Yeah. And became highly competitive in that vein. And I think, unfortunately, some folks that probably worked around me were like, God, that guy's just sandpaper on the forehead. <laughs> um, and, and I was, right? And now I'm kind of self-reflecting. God, yeah. I was. I was probably just an ass, <laughs> um, if I could say that. But but I've so what, I, what I've done over the years, I've, I've grown as an individual and become more confident in who I am. And, and the reality to recognize that, um, my success is only contingent on the on the success of the folks that work in and around me. Yes, um, 
And without them, I'm just the guy that walks around telling yeah. the story about being Carlos the dishwasher and no one wants to hear it, right? <laughs> we're not sitting down and talking. So. Yeah, man. So um, I don't know if you were aware, but I robbed you during the first interview because oh, yeah. um, you started talking about the, the significance of mentors. And oh, I said, yeah. we'll get around to that. Yeah. And we never did. Yeah. So now I owe you that conversation. Is there anything you want to mention before going to the speed round? I would tell you this. If you, I, I, I can attribute, and I, and I do attribute it, and I'll get a little teary sometimes thinking about it. Um, my success is because of my mentors. Yes. You know, um, from Howard BR to a gentleman named Greg Johnson to Scott Svensson, who's the CEO of Mod Pizza. Um, you know, some of these folks that I've, that I've been around in my career, I've taken little bits from them, right? And uh, sometimes just sitting in a room and not opening your mouth up. It's, it's when to know to not talk, right? To listen. Um, and I've become a much better listener from working with those kind of folks as mentors because I know when I have a challenge, and I have plenty of challenges in my life, both personal and professional, but mentors aren't there for just the professional, hey, the P&L looks bad, what do you think? Sometimes I call them and just like, hey, I'm, I'm tired. Help me understand why I'm doing this. Yeah. Right? And, and a lot of us have family we can go to with that, but that, you know, they love you. My mentors are folks I'm sure that love me, but they're also the reality to tell me, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. You're completely wrong. Yeah, they say iron for, yeah. carves iron, right? Yeah, and, you, and you, I have plenty of times. They're telling me, Chris, you're looking at it completely the wrong way. I remember calling one of my mentors one time like, and, and I, you know, one of one of my uh, my former peers runs another restaurant chain out of Portland, and uh, and I said, you know, she won't talk to me. She's mean. And and the mentor looked at me and laughed. He goes, she, you, you're just your feelings are hurt. Get over it. Move on. Yeah. Quit dwelling on it. Yeah. Right. And it was something. It sounds very small, but at that point in time, I was kind of walking around thinking, man, I'm a big, you know, I'm voodoo. She won't even talk to me. And, and uh, but it's just one of those lessons learned where I, it stays in my mind all the time, which is just. You know, just don't well, become so full. Sometimes we get so close to it, right? And yeah. It's like being in, like when you're in, and this is the analogy I use, when you're in Manhattan, can you see the island of Manhattan? <laughs> no, you can't because you're so close right. to it. And sometimes you need to get to like 20,000 feet to see the big picture, to, to see, yeah. you know, because you're, you're, yeah. you're just, you, you got to get away from it. You got to take a step back and see the big picture. Yeah, we could, we could, we could spend hours yeah. talking about the importance yeah. of mentors. And so, I, I just, I'm a big believer that I would not have been successful. Yeah. I know I wouldn't have been successful without the mentor. I, I wanted to make sure we left time for it because no, I, I mean it's right it. there on the the the, the, the yeah the, the melting yeah, pot yeah, of mentors. Yeah, right? no, I, I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, I, I would not be where. And I'm glad I got a chance to mention their names because they they are just some inspirational folks yeah. that have really made a difference in my life. And just this one last line before yeah. we go to the break. And the, again, the the mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform yeah. the industry. And when I say transform the industry, yeah. I'm talking about collecting all these mentors yeah. putting them in one spot because like you said 60% of Americans have worked in the restaurant industry right. we can't if we can I believe if we can change this industry we can change the world yeah. because we can influence so many young people and you know what I'm saying like that's totally. the mission and that's kind of what I'm trying to do so I just wanted to put an extra little bit yeah. of, of uh, you know light on that and sure. uh, we gotta go to the speed round yeah, we've been sitting here for a while yeah, yeah, <laughs> and please. I appreciate your time we're gonna no, take a quick break it. be right back this episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. We are back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? And this is your second run through the right. speed question, so I'm curious to see if your answers are going right. to be the same. So what is your it factor? Gratitude. I love it. Before it was failure is not an option, yeah, but that's gratitude. how we started today's yeah, conversation. Yeah, gra gratitude. Gratitude. I love gratitude. It. Be, be grateful. What is your biggest weakness? Oh, gosh. So this is speed round, so I'm supposed to answer quickly, right? <laughs> um, uh... My biggest weakness, God, there's so many of them. <laughs> uh, sometimes I, sometimes I get a little full of myself. Okay. Sometimes I, sometimes I start to read. I talk, I talk about not reading your own clippings. Sometimes I, I have to realize that I'm one person, and, and also that the success isn't about me. Yep, I love it. Uh, what is one piece of technology that you believe? Whoops, I'm just gonna skip that. What is one question you ask or thing you look for during the interview process when you're when you're growing your team? Uh, what are you passionate about? Well, what are you looking for? You to light up, right? Yes. So my number one question when you sit down with me in the interview, the very first question I ask you, what are you passionate about? And if you say, well, I'm passionate about work, I stop you. And I say, no, no, no. If you have all the money in the world, you can do one thing. You get up in the morning, what are you going to do? And if you can't light up when you talk about that, I can't teach you to be passionate. I just I can't teach it. you to be passionate. Beautiful stuff. Share one code of conduct or behavior 
You teach your team. This is a way to be, a way to act, a core value. Yeah, be honest. I love it. Be transparent. What is your biggest challenge today? Selling enough donuts. <laughs> Keep enough donuts in stock today. I mean, you asked me today. Yeah. Keep enough donuts in stock that we can supply all the donuts for Houston. But in general, it's 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 knowing when to grow and growing at the right pace and, and ensuring we have the right people. I think we dove enough into that, that today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is one standard of service you teach your team? So this is something that's standard within the four walls of your business. Be nice. I love it. Uh, what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant operator? Start with why. Yes, yeah, Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. Sinek. That's the new one. That's the new one. I'm, I'm, and I keep going back to you know I, I, I redo these books over and over again. But I will tell you, it's not about the coffee. Howard Br. You got to read that book. That's a that's a Bible I give to every single manager that joins Mod. Or joins Voodoo, excuse me, Mod that joins <laughs> Voodoo. Um, they start with that book because it's a, it's a, it's just a, the Bible that I kind of live by. I love it. Beautiful stuff. And what is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough? Uh, reflect, mm. right? Take the time to reflect. Take the time to, to reflect with your teams and reflect on your success and um, and and gut check with your teams. How how are they feeling? Yeah. Right? How are they doing? I love it. Share one service you've hired or, or outsourced to. So this is like a service that has a person that has a special skill, like a lawyer or a design group. Yeah. Or something so like yeah. Like. So two. So one is one is we uh, I outsourced or I, I hired a person to come in and help us with our PR. Okay. Can you share who? who the yeah, Audrey is? Linkoff, who's the one I worked with at, at Mod. Uh, sorry, at Starbucks. Um, we were really good about self-promoting, but but once we got outside of Portland, how do we how do we tell Houston we're coming? Yeah, right. And we knew that that we were really good in marketing the store, but we weren't good in telling our story. And mm-hmm. so she's done a really good job of helping us define who we are. Say her name one more time. Audrey Linkoff. Audrey Linkoff. I'll make sure yeah, we link to her business great. in the show notes. Yeah, and what is one great. piece of technology you've outsourced to, or uh, technology you're leveraging within the four walls that you had a huge return on? Well, you know, we just moved the to toast POS. Nice. Um, like any POS system, you know, I like them sometimes and I hate them sometimes. I'm in a restaurant tour, right? And yeah. When, I, when we chose them, I... You could probably build a better POS, I, I right? To, I told him exactly. I told him <laughs> there's going to be times I'm not going to like you. Yeah. I'm just going to be honest with you, right? It's just the, it's how much I don't like you yeah. will tell me if you're successful so or not. So there's a ton of options out there. What was it about Toast that made you go? Yeah. There? You know, I think they were they were the right for us. They were, they were focused for us given our size of organization and our growth. They're... Um, you know, I would be so bold to say they're probably not an enterprise-wide system right now. They're, they'll probably yell at me for that. Um, cause, but for a company of our size where we're at and our ability to kind of be a little bit nimble, um, we were a cash-only operation yeah. up until March of last wow. year, right? We still don't do online ordering, right? We're, we're, we're kind of crawling through some of these real business principles that a lot of folks, I'm sure, on the podcast are already doing. Yeah. Um, but so we chose Toast, and they've been a good partner for us as we kind so of So was it along. because – is it – what was it? Ex- I don't think I caught what it was. That they were they were perfect. They were they had a perfect. Um, their technology was perfect for the size we were. Gotcha. Um, we don't have a we don't have an IT department. Uh, we, we we don't have an IT individual. My but, one of my assistants actually is she's kind of knows IT, so she's kind of our yeah. IT person, um, which is every small company, right? Yeah. Um, and they speak the language of the restaurant operator at mm-hmm. our size. Yeah. And I think what's cool is that they have a lot of these features that you need already built in, like online ordering and delivery. Exactly. So like you don't have to necessarily think of another solution. Right. It's, exactly. It's They're all in, all inclusive, right? Yeah. They're all inclusive. And, and that was where we need to be because we just didn't we didn't have the resources to, to start plugging things into yeah. it. So uh, real quick, Toast is by far the number one recommended POS on the show. They do have an affiliate program. So if you guys have not reached out to Toast yet, if you're listening to this and you have not reached out to Toast yet, and you're interested, even if you didn't discover Toast through Restaurant Unstoppable, but we kept them top of mind for you, right. please reach out to me, shoot me an email, right. or use my And that, and that wasn't a commercial. You didn't tell me about Toast. That's no, this no, isn't planned. Yeah, yeah. Like, and like, yeah. I, something I need to be better about is training my listeners to right. like say, "Hey, like, I need your help." Sure, you know, like you're learning about all these tools. Yeah, like, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can support the show by using my links or letting me introduce you. Um, or at least let them know that you heard through the right. show. So that way, it really helps out the show. And um, and you know, I might even be able to get you a discount. So I should have called you. Oh no, no, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm just, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is the last question. Sure. It's a doozy. If you got the news, you, you're leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure. With the exception of three pieces of wisdom you could leave behind for your legacy and for the good of humanity, what would those three pieces of wisdom be? Wow. Holy I'm cow. A deep mofo. You didn't did, did, did prep me to that one after an hour and a half of talking. 
You didn't prep me for that one. Um, be grateful. One. Be humble. Two. I mean, I got one locked and loaded that you mentioned a few times already, but I don't want, I don't want to be start. authentic. Yes, I love it. Great stuff. Yeah. I've enjoyed this conversation so much. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and, I, and I'm I'm open, Eric, as as need be. If people want to reach out, um, as I've said, listen, I'm only as good as my mentors. And if anyone listening wants to reach out and make a connection and, and wants to ask me questions, I'm I'm. I was joking totally about dude. putting your phone no, number in totally. the show notes. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm listen. I'll, I'm oh, open. But I'm, I'm, dude, I'm I'm a. Uh, I appreciate you coming out. It's an honor to be here. Um, if, if we are interested in Voodoo Donut and we want to maybe come join the team or maybe yeah. we want to, I don't know if you guys are franchising. No, we don't franchise. No, we don't. We like, we have two license agreements. Like I said, with Universal, we don't franchise. We could spend hours talking about franchising uh, Another and time, not franchising, <laughs> choosing to franchise, not choosing franchise. We've chosen not to franchise. Um, and so we're not franchising. Hey, when I'm in Portland, we can have that conversation. If you're oh, you're right on. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, we don't franchise. But if you want to learn more about Voodoo Donut, it's Voodoo Donut and it's Donut, right? Because it's not Do Nut because you need dough to make a donut. So it's <laughs> yeah. not Do Nut. Uh, and we, we still have Donut in our name, not to poke one of our competitors, um, Duncan. Uh, we still have Donut in our name. So VoodooDonut.com is, is our website. And follow us on Instagram, Twitter. All those Facebook, all those cool things that are out and there. And what's the best place to reach you if you want to communicate? Yeah, so very simply, I'm Chris at Voodoo Donut. It's real simple, right? We're small enough still. I can use one name till we hire another Chris, I guess. Awesome. Uh, Chris at VoodooDonut.com. Uh, Beautiful. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Eric, I appreciate you. i got to have you call somebody out. Who's one person you respect and admire and think would be a great guest on the show? Oh, uh, I, I said that Howard Bihar, and, Howard. And, or or I I would get Scott Svensson, who's the CEO of, of, of Mod. If you haven't, let me know. Set I'll, the bar high. I'll I, make it I work. I love it, and that would be amazing. Uh, and just again, thank you so much. Um, there oh, is no question. Thanks for driving down. Man, you are unstoppable. Oh, dude, you're you're <laughs> awesome. I appreciate it. Thank thanks. You. Cheers.